At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Good evening. Welcome to our wonderful book launch this evening, 50 Years of Failed Drugs Policy. We're here to celebrate the launch of drug science's latest book, Drug Science and British Drug Policy. So thank you all for coming. In case you don't know what drug science is, drug science is the UK's leading drug policy charity. We conduct our own research and we produce educational resources and run events like these throughout the year. And we we keep going because we've got amazing community supporters. So if you're interested in becoming part of our community and you're not already part of it, please do go on our website or chat to some of the team here in the break or after the talks this evening to find out more about what it means to become part of our community. My name is Mags and I'm part of the drug science team and you're all very welcome here tonight. So why are we here and what are we going to be talking about tonight? Well, it all started in 1971. Now I wasn't alive in 1971 but I've got some fun facts about what happened during that year. A loaf of bread in 1971 cost nine pence. Disney's Aristocats was released. Great film. Elon Musk was born in 1971. <laughs> so was Steve Rolls, apparently. Rod Stewart released hit single Maggie May, classic. But most importantly, the Christmas number one in 1971 was Benny Hill's Ernie the Fastest Milkman in the West, which I think we can all agree is a, an absolute banger even today. So lots of fun facts. But unfortunately, 1971 was also the year that the Misuse of Drugs Act came into force. Boo. In his foreword to our new book, the Right Honourable Norman Baker describes the Misuse of Drugs Act as one of the worst pieces of social legislation passed by the British Parliament in his lifetime. He calls it a knee-jerk law to try and win a war that could never be won. The war on drugs has failed, and we have had to suffer through more than 50 years of its failure. So tonight is a call to put an end to this madness, to look to solutions that recognize the evidence base and treat drug use as a health issue, as it should be. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from some of the UK's leading experts in drug policy in two back-to-back panel discussions, which will be led by Professor David Nutt who's at the front here. After these panels, you'll have time to enjoy mingling and socialising as you have been already tonight and to ensure that you can buy a book from the back if you haven't already and to get it signed by some of the authors who are here this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Professor David Nutt to come onto stage and lead the first panel. Thank you. I made it! Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm amazed. So many people turned up. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, shows we're winning the war, maybe, but the right war, not the wrong war. It's the war for rationality and, uh, and common sense. Uh, uh, how many of you are supporters currently? A bit higher, higher. I can't s- so about a third of you. Well, the good news is that um, we've got an inducement for those who aren't currently our supporters or community. That if you join tonight or le- within the next week or so, you will get even more of this wonderful drink you're drinking, which is called Sentia. And as uh, some of you may know, or maybe none of you know, I don't know. At the back there, stand up, David, please. This is the man that's uh, helped us uh, develop this. Uh, this, in- this is David Oren, who's uh, the uh, uh, managing director of this uh, company called Gabba Labs, of which Sentia is the first of uh, a number of uh, alcohol alternatives that will, will be being developed over the next few years. Uh, and we're, there's a 
a relationship has developed between uh, Gabba Labs and, uh, and Drug Science so that uh, they will, that some of the profits, well, if there are any at some point, um, from, <laughs> from Gabba Labs will support Drug Science. But you, we, we want, what we would like to do, and this is a, quite a serious uh, offer to you, if you like it and you want to become part of the, uh, we might call the sort of the tribe of initiating this new concept of drinking without the toxicity of alcohol, then you'll be able to sign up and, uh, and become part of our, that group. And you'll, the drug science will benefit, and also the, uh, the cause of, um, of harm reduction in terms of uh, alcohol consumption will also uh, take off. So enjoy the drinks. There'll be some more back there for you to have in the interval. So that's just a bit of the kickoff. Um, obviously, the, the main purpose of tonight is to uh, celebrate the... Uh, remarkable achievement of producing the book which I see many of you have already bought and uh, afterwards I guess if those of you who haven't bought it will decide on whether you should have had a copy based on what the uh, the conversations are that go ahead over the next uh, two hours. What we're planning to do is this, we are, uh, we're going to turn the conversations on the stage tonight into podcasts. So, the, How many of you have listened to my podcasts? Yeah, so you know there's quite a few of them, Well, we're going to have two more after tonight and you'll be hearing them live rather than recorded for a change. So we're going to have the guests up here. I'm going to ask them some questions. They're going to give us some honest answers, and it'll all be recorded. And the plan is about um, about 35 to 40 minutes of a dialogue, and then we'll throw it open for about 10 minutes for those of you who want to ask questions as well. All right? Good. So let's kick off then. So the first group are Val Curran, Alex Stevens, and Ros Gittins. Okay, how's the microphone sounding? Good, everyone's happy being here? Good, good. So, this is uh, a group of uh, three individuals with very different backgrounds, but uh, all of which, I think when when you hear them talk, well, you'll see they're very complimentary. So I'm going to ask each person to introduce themselves and and tell us a little bit about why they joined drug science and, and what they're doing in their lives, and particularly in terms of research. And then we'll have a discussion about uh, what went wrong and how we can go forward. So let's start with Alex. Well, thanks, David. My name's Alex Stevens. I'm professor in criminal justice at the University of Kent. And I stick out on this panel as being, I think, the only social scientist on the panel. I got into researching drug policy because I was working with people who use drugs um, for pleasure, distress, or to make money out of. And I got rather puzzled about the way we treat um, those people and this issue. And so I got into researching. Why are we um, doing it the way we're doing it? Is there a logic to punishing people as a threat to deter them from drug use? And as many people before me have found, that logic doesn't really exist. And so I got into, for example, researching the use of treatment as a way of reducing crime and got up to this problem that David has covered in his own career of producing reports getting invited onto the advisory council on the misuse of drugs. Those reports only being accepted if they encourage harsher punishment and tougher control of drugs. And so 10 years after David was sacked from the ACMD for, amongst other things, pointing out that ecstasy is safer than horse riding per episode of use, I resigned from the ACMD in frustration at the political meddling in the membership of what should be supposedly an independent body. So, for example, our colleague Neve Eastwood, who's here, we'll be speaking later, um, was barred entry to the ACMD on the basis, basically, that the minister didn't like what she said, which what she was saying was perfectly respectable. And so, having resigned from the ACMD, David invited me to join Drug Science. Very happy to do so, and very happy to be invited to help edit this book, because this book is, I'm sure you'll agree, if you've read it, fantastic, in its diversity and quality. I'm really looking forward to discussing it. Thanks, Alex. You'll be pleased to know that Alex, uh, along with Fiona Misham, who's unfortunately not here, wrote a really interesting paper a few years ago on the ratchet poli- uh, feature of UK drug policy. And I was teaching this week. This was my heavy teaching week. I was teaching BSc students on drug policy, master's students on drug policy, and global health students on drug policy. And to each of them, I p- pointed out the ratchet do you want to explain to them what the ratchet is? The drug, Fiona and I called it the drug policy ratchet because drug policy only turns in one direction. 
So if the ACMD advises the government to put something in the, in the Act or to move it up from C to B or up from B to A, the government will usually accept that recommendation. But if the ACMD makes recommendations the other way, for example, when David was chair of the ACMD, the Advisory Council on Misuse of Drugs, you recommended that cannabis should be in Class C rather than Class B. You recommended that ecstasy, MDMA, should be in Class B rather than Class A. Now, the cannabis recommendation was accepted for a while, but sure enough, the rack shit rewound. It slips occasionally, but sure enough, it got rewound that in 2009, cannabis, despite the ACMD's process stations, was put back in Class B. Ecstasy has never been moved down from Class A to Class B, but plenty of substances over the years have been revi reviewed by the ACMD, which has said, well, this is similar to a drug that is already in class A, for example. So all the novel tryptamines, for example, were put in class A, not because anyone was taking them or that we knew what their effects were, but because they were something like LSD, and LSD is in class A, so they should be there. That's what the ACMD said. And the Home Office said, sure enough, you're saying that. It's nice and tough. Let's do it. So the ratchet is there because it only, it only turns towards tightness. It doesn't liberalize. Thank you, Alex. So we'll move on to Val now. now so you've heard already about the transient reclassification of cannabis from... Once upon a time, a cannabis was in A or B, depending on the uh, particular product, and uh, it was downgraded in 2004 to, or to C. And, and part of that was driven by the work that Val had done looking at the true harms of cannabis as opposed to the fictitious harms. So introduce yourself, Val, and then share us a little bit uh, of what you've done with cannabis. Okay, I, I came into the drug world as a scientist. I was really intrigued by the fact that drugs were a sort of window on the brain and studying the effects of drugs on the brain was a window on psychology and people's emotions and their thoughts. I'm at the moment doing a massive amount of work on cannabis in terms of effects on that, the adolescent brain, because, you know, that's often when cannabis starts. And a lot of our work has been influenced because when someone in Brazil found that there were different effects of different types of canna cannabinoids in cannabis, as you probably know, there are over 140 different cannabinoids in cannabis. Most studies are the effects of THC, which is the stuff that makes you stoned. It's why people use it. And the effects of something that doesn't make you stoned, but still acts on the brain, is cannabidiol or CBD. So we studied that a lot in the lab, experimentally giving drugs. We have a home office license to give drugs to people. Even to 16-year-olds now, we can give drugs and that's really been taught us a lot about cannabis THC causing dependence in some people. But CBD, we have shown, acts against that. So that within the same plant, within the same cannabis, you've got something that causes one of the harms, but also something that cures. So by manipulating the different ingredients in cannabis, you can produce a cannabis that's not harmful uh, at all. I mean, most people don't get dependent on cannabis. Maybe 10% do. But if we had a, a nice balanced cannabis, then for that you need a proper drug policy that would allow us to legalize cannabis, preferably controlled by the state. And then you can really reduce the harms uh, of, of these compounds. And similarly, you know, it, within that sort of framework, drugs like MDMA, which has gone, you know, Fiona Meacham again has shown that, you know, the doses of MDMA at festivals can go three times an acceptable level. And we're, our current work on adolescents, we asked the adolescents and the adults in our study to bring in a sample of their own cannabis that they were smoking at the time or it, taking it in other ways. And we had them analyzed and they found that in some of the samples, there was THC was 37%, you know, 10%, 15%, 15% people call skunk, 37% is toxic. So it, it's not working, really, the misuse of drugs. That's been a disaster. It's created more harms through stop and search and through criminalization than the, any of the drugs themselves on the whole. Thanks, well, that's good. So, and uh, we'll move on to Ros now. Ros, so... Ros is uh, very much also into harm reduction, but Ros is a pharmacist, and you're going to tell us what you've been doing. Um, from a slightly different yeah, aspect. So by profession, said I'm a pharmacist. 
In my day job, as it were, I'm currently the director of pharmacy for one of the national third sector treatment providers. I wear a couple of different hats. One also is the current president of the International College of Mental Health Pharmacy. I'm with various research interests, and particularly around things like the over misuse of over-the-counter <clears throat> and prescription medication use. And I think one of the other things from a harm reduction, uh, harm reduction angle is looking at how we can get some of this theory into practice. So things like a few years ago, back in 2019, co ran the first ever home office licensed drug checking service. We now got things like on-site home office license, pharmacy technician-led um, innovations. So for me, there's something about how we bring some of this uh, theory and make it that reality in, in terms of uh, provision of, of uh, treatment services, I think. And yeah, bringing it to the fore to the, you know, some of the most vulnerable people that we've got within our communities is where, what really drives me, I think. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, you've all been in the, this field for quite a number of years. So let me ask each of you to reflect on what, what do you think was actually the worst of the uh, consequences of the act? So, again, over to, let's start with you, Alex. I'm not sure how you could rank them, but certainly one of the worst consequences of the Misuse of Drugs Act is a consequence that was predicted when it was still just a bill back in nine, the 1969-70. My late and dear colleague, Jock Young, wrote a brilliant book that some of you may have read. I, if you haven't, I really advise it. He wrote a book called The Drug Takers about the social meaning of drug use. And in that book, he predicted that the Misuse of Drugs bill, as it then was, would be disproportionately and unequally applied to bohemians, hippies, and black people. And that has proven to be one of the most accurate predictions about the Mrs. Drugs Act that we've got, in that there's a chapter in the book that I co-authored with my PhD student, Bizi Akintoye and Amal Ali, which shows this ongoing intergenerational impact of the disproportionate policing of drug laws and the massive impact it has, particularly on young black men and their families. And so this was known, you know, it wasn't a surprise to anybody who knew anything about drug taking or drug laws, that it would have this disproportionate, unequal impact on black communities. It was known, the politicians were told, and we've seen it going on for this 50 years and more, and still it goes on, still it is the fact that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs offenses than white people are. This is often justified on the basis that there's a lot of knife crime in black communities. Well, even if that's the case, it's only tiny proportion, as we show in the chapter in the book, only tiny proportion of stop and searches are for knives. The majority are for, on the, on the purportedly for drugs. The majority don't find any drugs. Many of them are simply for smell of cannabis, which even by the police's guidance should be used to release and leave these to I think Neve might be talking a bit more about this yeah. when we get her up on stage. I'll, I'll, I'll you stop can correct him, Neve, if, if he's got it wrong. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and leave Neve to, to tell the full horror of the story. But I think the, the, the racial impact that this has is one of the biggest harmful consequences that the Misuse of Drugs Act has had. Well, what do you want to reflect on what you think is the worst? Well, I totally agree with what Alex says that I think, you know, if you're black, you have, you're eight times more likely to have a criminalization after stop and search uh, than if you're not black. But the, the worst thing overall is that the Misuse of Drugs Act was designed or was aimed to reduce the harms of drugs. But because the drugs are mostly in the control of criminal cartels, it's had the opposite effect. It's increased the harms of drugs. So it's, it's not attained anything to do. What, I mean, they've, they've actually gone against themselves in the end and increased the harms. Ross? It's the deaths. They're not going anywhere. Yeah, well, so explain to people a bit more about that, because not everyone knows quite how bad things are out it. So our death rates have gone through the roof in recent years, and still the UK and Scotland in particular. Um, we've got some of the highest rates of drug-related death in the world, and that's without the opioid ep epidemic that North, North America has seen, and hopefully we don't get over here. So it remains ongoing. And I think until something really shifts, we're always going to be challenged by that. I think also thinking from a harm reduction perspective, we can't even legally give out crack pipes at the moment, which isn't about condoning the use of drugs or saying that it's okay to use per se. It's about let's make things safer for people, actually. And if we're looking at even during COVID, we tried and we lobbied 
you know, because obviously that's again a, um, a risk of, of transmission of, of uh, communicable diseases, that this is something we were really aware of and thinking about our hep C rates. You know, we really want to aim for microelimination across the country. And yes, you're less likely to spread through kind of snorting or smoking of crack, but it's still a risk when we think about our BVB transmission. So that remains ongoing as well. I mean, there has been some progress. I mean, we have managed, sorry, it, we, I don't know who we are, but I mean, certainly when I was on the ACMD, we did manage to begin the process of bringing in harm reduction for opiate users. And so there wasn't, I mean, it was like, you know, drawing blood from a stone, but there was, over 20 years, there has been a bit of progress. Is that not yeah, we're able to issue foil, so that's a good start. Go. We have got needle syringe provision. It's a great start, but I think what I'm saying is there's so much more we could be doing. And that's, that's a frustrating thing, I think. Alex? And it's, it's not just the Act, is it? It's, it's the regulations that go with the Act. So, you know, for example, we, I chair the Drug Science Enhanced Harm Reduction Working Group, um, on which Ros sits as well. And we're working towards the setting up and evaluation of an overdose prevention centre in the UK. Now, these are services that exist in many countries, primarily um, Canada and Australia, where people who inject drugs can do so in a safe environment, and if they overdose, they will have their life saved. And many people in this country, I um, think many people in this room, would think that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. Why don't we do it? One of the reasons we don't do it is because the government says it's illegal. We are, you know, that's a, it's a legal grey area. Again, Neve is more of an expert than I on these matters as a qualified lawyer. But it's not illegal to run a premise where people inject heroin. It is, weirdly, thanks to the Misuse of Drugs Act and uh, idiosyncrasies, illegal to run a premise where people smoke cannabis or smoke opium, but not if they inject heroin. Obviously, if somebody comes to a drug consumption of an overdose prevention centre, they're in possession of heroin, then they're committing an offence. And that, that's where the legal grey area comes in. So what we're hoping... And what we've asked, and we've worked with the Faculty of Public Health and many august medical bodies now, to call for a change to the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001. Again, Ros will be very familiar with these because a pharmacist, you're always relying on the exemptions that are in the regulations that say a pharmacist can be in possession of these substances. And we hope a sensible move could be made. It doesn't even require primary legislation. It's a stroke of the Home Secretary's pen to say that people who are using and running an overdose prevention centre will be exempted from prosecution for possession of these substances while they're in the process of saving people's lives. And I think that's just another example of this sort of this you know, obstreperousness, really, the stickiness mm -hmm. of the Misuse of Drugs Act and that mindset around it that we've got to be scared of drugs, we've got to press clamp down on them, which has caused so much harm to black communities and the deaths that we're seeing at record levels right now. Yeah, quite well. Well, we'll keep you all posted. Those of you who are are community members, you'll obviously get the newsletters and those of you who want, you can follow me on Twitter and follow Drug Science on Twitter. And when that room is, or well, that facility is going, you will know. And hopefully it won't be too long. So, but then that gets to the, talking about regulation. So, Val, you've done some interesting work because although you do have your, you know, your, your rooms at UCL and you do have your license to give drugs to people, but you, most, a lot of your work has been done doing something rather different, which is actually allowing people to take their own drugs and finding out what, uh, what happens there. So I just want to share that with us because that's, a, that's a, a powerful way of coping with the fact you can't do very systematic research in, in laboratories, but you can at least take advantage of the real world self-administration. Back in the day with raves around King's Cross, I mean, that, we made those into laboratories and it was great because we were able to kind of study people doing the things you do on MDMA and dancing and being with, with other people and being empathic and having loads of fun. And then we took them into a sort of room on the side and we gave them lots of psychological tests, which they laughed through. Um, and then we followed them up days later. So we were able to study people taking illegal substances before we were then allowed to, to get a license from the home office and bring them into a lab. But it was, you know, the effects of drugs clearly depend on the context in which you take them. And to take MDMA where you're not dancing and not, you know, being with loads of your mates and listening to fun music, it's a completely different effect when you're doing that in the lab. But yeah, it's been a challenging thing for scientists, but I think we come up with some amazing ways of actually looking at the effects. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you've also done some, you've already mentioned in your 
you know, when we spoke a, you know, a minute or two ago about your work with cannabis, getting people to bring in what they're taking. You know, I think it was about 2008 you showed that very nice paper that there was a this balance of CBD versus THC had a huge impact on, in, particularly in terms of whether people got paranoid. And that was all done on individuals. That was all there. done on individuals' hair, actually. Your hair grows at about a centimetre a month. And the follicle contains information about what drugs you've taken. And so we used hair samples. We took hair samples from people and analysed them. And we found that people who's, who didn't, whose hair contained high levels of THC but no CBD had more paranoid and psychotic reactions when we tested them than people who had either no cannabinoids in their hair, so they actually weren't using cannabis, and people who had CBD and THC. So if they had the balance, there was no mental health effect at all. So that that was before the first trials, which are now showing that CBD is actually a positive treatment for people with schizophrenia and other types of psychotic disorders. Yeah, I, I, I still use that slide from that uh, paper of yours because if you look I'm at honoured, David. I'm you, honoured. Not just to show the paranoia, but if you go two, two histograms along, you see that actually the mixture, the group that was taking the mixture had better mental health, better mood. Than the control population. Yes. I know that was just, it was significant. A little bit, a little bit. Okay, so that's it. She just uh, it emphasises the point. And a lot of you won't know this, but the UK actually one of the few things that the Misuse of Drugs Act got right in 1971 was not to criminalise cannabidiol. That was because the chemists on the committee at the time realised it wasn't psychoactive. Now most other countries in the world did assume because it started with C A N N that it was, it was a cannabis, it was like cannabis. And one of the things that drug science did, again, you know, I was quite involved with this, we, we went to the WHO and tried to persuade them, both cannabidiol was actually not, both not psychoactive and also quite useful as a therapy, which is now obviously licensed as a therapy, at least for, uh, for some forms of epilepsy, and it's quite likely to be available, well, it is available on T21, um, for disorders like uh, anxiety, PTSD, and sleep, etc. So that was a major achievement that drug science made. Uh, but then we went back and tried to persuade them that THC was actually a medicine. And eventually we won that argument. It was a big, big battle. So WHO now accept that cannabis is a medicine. Uh, so they've you know, internationally accepted that. But uh, the United Nations still hasn't managed to move things on. And you know, one of the things I'm going to ask Steve Rolls in the next talk is, why, what hell's he been doing for the last 10 years? You know, given that he's had so much evidence from drug science to really make things change. But we'll come to that later. Uh, and as David has written about extensively, you know, there's, it applies to so many other psychoactive drugs that are potential medicines. So MDMA, psilocybin, DMT, the list goes on. And it's been really hard for researchers to kind of do the research on these drugs until recently because they've been illegal. So it's stopping medicines as well as causing more right. harms to drug users recreationally. Yeah. It's a double whammy, isn't it? Yeah. You actually, it makes things worse for recreational users and makes things even, even worse for people who might benefit. Patients, yeah. But it's interesting, David, that you mentioned that the Misuse of Drugs Act, much as we criticise it, did have some positive things, partly because the scientists were around at the time yeah. making some reasonably sensible decisions. And in the book, there's a really fascinating chapter by Toby Seddon about how the Misuse of Drugs Act in its day was seen as a more liberal way of doing drug policy because before the Misuse of Drugs Act, for example, there wasn't any distinction between the punishment for heroin and cannabis. So people like Baroness Wooten, I mean, this is a, this is a really interesting, interesting tradition in British drug policy of some very distinguished and formidable women making huge contributions, so Baroness Wooten being one of them, Ruth Runciman being mm -hmm. another, and Carol Black being the most mm -hmm. sort of recent of this line of mm -hmm. incredibly formidable and distinguished women mm -hmm. um, who've made these you know, contributions. And Baroness Wooten's was to try and separate out the treatment of heroin from cannabis. And then because of the operation of the ratchet ever since, there's been this move towards trying to bring everything back in the same bucket and saying, no, these things are wrong, these things are bad, we have to punish people. The latest example being the group of Tory MPs and, and police and crime commissioners who want for some reason to put cannabis in Class A, as if putting anything in Class A was ever a solution to anything. 
Well, now you've raised it. So what do you think the motive is? To me? Yeah. Well, I'm writing another book about that, David. Okay. Um, so I'm well, writing, about, <laughs> I'm writing a book. Sneak about, preview here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Comes to the next launch. I'm writing a book about the role of power and morality in drug policy. And if you map out the various positions in drug policy, you find there's sort of division in the field between people like us who have certain yeah. views and other people who have other views. So there's a group of people who are, you know, more progressive and interested in social justice. I'm looking at Neve again, Steve Rolls. Um, there's a group of people who are libertarian, so people like the Institute of Economic Affairs who want to li legalise cannabis and psilocybin for commercial as well as medical use. Um, there's a group of paternalists, people around uh, the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, for example, who think that they know best, maybe they do know best some, in some occasions, but they think they should control the population, as they did during the pandemic, for good or bad, by limiting their freedom in order to protect them from various health helms, including the harms of drugs. And there's a, the, but the most influential group are what I call the traditionalists, the people who believe that drug use is morally wrong. And those people, despite they'll talk a good game about the evidence, like we are you know, committed to certain moral principles, they're committed to certain moral principles, and those moral principles don't overlap with the idea that it's okay to use drugs. And it's very hard to persuade those people with evidence because for them, that's not an evidential gain. This is a moral principle that you're, as I call it, the moral sidestep. Yeah. You can't yeah. get at that, that worldview with evidence. It's yeah. about the story of what it is to be human and what is right and wrong. And so that is my explanation. Yeah, you do have that wonderful quote about Theresa May. <laughs> Do you want to share anything? I mean, it's brilliant. You know, well, this is an when example. You analyze of, yeah. your analysis. You know. This is an example of what I call the moral sidestep. So Theresa May, when she was prime minister, was challenged by Ronnie Cowan at Prime Minister's Question Times, and Ronnie, Ronnie Cowan said, "We've got this drug death crisis. We know that drug consumption rooms would be a solution and would save people's lives. Will the prime minister support the introduction of drug consumption rooms?" And instead of her answer being on evidence, we don't believe that drug consumption rooms <laughs> save lives. Her answer was. Unlike some members of this house, we are not liberals. We believe there needs to be a tough approach to drugs. It's immune to the evidence. It's about who you are as a moral being, not as an evidential empirical statement. And that's why I call it the moral sidestep. You've also left out the P word, though. Politics. I mean, it always seems to me that most of the drug laws have been driven by politics rather than even by moral principles. I mean, do you want to comment on that? Or am I thinking I've overstepped the mark there? I think it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because if you think about politics, the, the two big parties in our country which are vying for power are the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. And when you, you map their moral positions on drugs, they're, they're all over the spectrum. You know, it's not that the Labour Party is on the left on drugs and the Conservatives on the right. There's some pretty harsh social conservatives in the Labour Party and there's some pretty radical libertarians in the Conservative Party. So I think it's this moral grouping what I call policy constellations, this traditionalist policy constellation that is in control of drugs. And that's what, why we have this state of inertia and why we need, as a community, to try so hard to overcome it through telling stories, creating empathy, as well as producing the evidence that you, you and your colleagues have done so well. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. But I think also we should admit that as our, ourselves as scientists and medics and people working in this field, that we're not immune to the morality as well. And certainly if you look at the people who fund drug research and research on, on the brain, they certainly aren't immune from immorality issues, and especially in the States. You know, in the States, they, they have a, a National Institute of Drug Abuse that grew cannabis for scientists to use. And the cannabis they grew had 4% THC. It was even less than in, when I was an undergraduate <laughs> many years ago. 4% doesn't exist in, in cannabis nowadays. It's, it's all at least 10%. And scientists have been known to, the, the funders have always said, we want to investigate the harms of drugs, you know, never the pleasures. <laughs> we were doing this adolescent experiment we're putting people into a, a brain scanner once they'd inhaled cannabis of different sorts with different THC and CBD. And, and we showed very clearly that the reward centers of their brain lit up hugely after they'd had active, the real stuff, the real cannabis. 
if we showed them Bart Simpson ca cartoons, mm -hmm. if we allowed them to have cannabis dripped into their mouths, no, sorry, chocolate dripped into their mouths while they were in the scanner, and if we played them their favourite music, you know, there's been so little research done on the pleasures that we're really emphasising that now, and I think that's a moral issue. Ros? And I think it would also add to that, there's an educational piece as well, isn't there? And you mentioned around kind of qualified healthcare professionals and within scientists, that actually isn't even taught really anything around harm reduction or around drug use at all on majority of undergraduate courses, let alone at postgrad if you decide to go down that route. And that's amongst qualified healthcare professional training. So there's an awful lot to do, I think, more broadly. And I think with some of the resources that, that drug science are producing, I think if we can hopefully start to maybe Im embed some of those, because the only way that we're able to deliver some of this education at the moment is if we happen to sit on the faculty delivering that and there's not enough of us to go around. So I think there's, yeah, that wider piece around education as well is a really important part. Yeah, so those of you, some of you may not know, but uh, Drug Science has set up some student societies. How many universities have we got? 17 universities in this country have, uh, have drug science students. Internationally, how many in this country? 15, okay. Where are the other two then? Oh, we're in Melbourne. Oh, that meant that. oh yeah, I think that's why, they, that's why my talk there was so popular last week. Yeah, so. yeah. Anyway, that's, just, that's an amazing thing we're doing because uh, we've, we've, we've realized, uh, I think as, you, as, as you're pointing out, Ross, that the only way to really educate the teachers in universities is to educate the students and the students will eventually kick the teachers into some kind of shape. So, and drug science has provided an enormous repertoire of slides across a whole range of different disorders so, and, and different drugs so that uh, even the teachers can't say they don't, they don't know where to get hold of the data or the info because it's all on our website. So uh, well done for doing that. This, just, just going back to this, uh, we've got a few minutes left, just come back to the U um, UK and um, Ros, I want you to say a bit about Scotland because Scotland has been struggling with policies but has made some big changes in the last few years and do you, I know you've been involved in yeah, some of that I think there's a lot of work still to be done up there but every time I in fact I was this morning actually on another call with uh, colleagues up in Scotland and they are doing some really positive work but we still don't as yet have you know overdose prevention center as, as got the van. tell them about the van no the van's long gone oh, the van. Oh. yeah the van there with the work that peter briefly like, did yeah. um in fact i think it's now donated to transform i think actually just to help raise awareness of that so right. for a short period of time but it wasn't sanctioned as such mm. so that remains ongoing um they have at least got funding to get off the ground within three main cities a drug checking kind of work stream up there but it hasn't actually happened yet, um, but they're getting, hopefully, fingers crossed, ever closer to it. I think the drug use and the types of substances we see being utilised does vary by geography, but particularly with benzo deaths and, and thinking what we're you know, able to do around that. And we've always had quite a, a high threshold, I think, around benzodiazepine uh, kind of substitute prescribing um, because we're aware of the long-term risks associated with, with the use of benzos. But I've got a feeling that might start to shift as well. And I, you know, I think it's too early to tell exactly what will happen. But I think we need to revisit what we're doing around uh, benzos. But we are actually able now to give out naloxone, so a, a short-acting kind of antidote, if you like, to uh, opioids, so things like heroin. And actually the provision of take-home naloxone is, you know, is definitely getting there. We know that at the moment we're hoping, fingers crossed, for a legislative change that's been out for consultation and we remain optimistic that it will be possible for not just the Commission Drug Treatment Service providers to be able to give that out for free for people, but to be able to widen the scope of that. And so Scotland is you know, certainly helping to, to drive forward some of those shifts. So it's positive direction, but still more to be done. Thanks. I think the main problem for Scotland is the fact that the Misuse of Drugs Act is not devolved. So the Misuse of Drugs Act applies across the United Kingdom, whereas the health policy is done at the national government level. And the SNP, who is in, in charge of the government in Scotland, would very much like to do more in terms of harm reduction. And also its official policy is that drug possession should be decriminalised. Mm -hmm. And so if the SNP, would, which they ask for, were to have drug policy devolved to it, they would probably decriminalise drug possession. And in the book, there is a blueprint for how to do it. Um, Neve. 
uh, Eastwood, Kirsty Dowse and I have written one of the chapters in the book. Uh, we call it a modest proposal to decriminalize drug possession. We call it modest, not just because I don't think it's as, as dangerous as people eating their children <laughs> during the Irish famine. It's not that sort of modest proposal. It's about how modest it would be just for the government to remove subsections 5.1 and subsection 5.2 from the Misuse of Drugs Act, and that would be a decriminalization of drug possession. It would no longer be a criminal offense to be in possession of, of these substances for one's own personal use. And it would be such an easy thing to do. And the research that I've done, research that many people have done in the UK and elsewhere, suggests there's no evidence, or very little evidence, that removing the threat of punishment for the possession of drugs has any effect in increasing use or increasing harms. So, you know, the Health and Social Care Committee of the House of Commons, the Scottish Affairs Committee, the Scottish National Party, the Green Party, there is a political movement mm. towards the decriminalization of drug possession. And in the book, we've provided a, a blueprint of how to do it. Yeah, oh, before we finish, we've got a few more minutes. So I think uh, I just want to reflect on the fact that you know, bad as things have been here, there are places where they've been worse. Uh, but uh, I, just, I want to finish. I want Val to have a, a chance to tell you her wonderful anecdote about how she gave evidence in New York for the American Civil Liberties Union about MDMA harms, uh, not compared with horse riding, I think, compared with cooking. <laughs> yes, in, in America, they have a, a strange way of deciding how long you should serve in prison once you've been caught with dealing drugs or whatever. And it's all based on cannabis equivalents. So every single drug has a cannabis equivalent. So heroin's very high. MDMA, uh, when in 2010, when they asked me to give evidence in court, had a net, has a cannabis equivalent of, I can't remember exactly now, but let's, say, let's call it X. And then a person came along called George Ricorte, an academic, who had been doing research on rats, and he'd been giving doses of MDMA about 10 times what a normal human being would take in terms of you know, weight per milligram. And based on his work, he had... I mean, I was actually there with him at Congress when we were talking to Congress about MDMA and MDMA's effects. And he claimed that MDMA would cause permanent brain damage in humans based on his work with monkey and rats. So the court case came because after this Congress meeting, the, the punishment, uh, the marijuana equivalents, was increased by tenfold so that you'd serve 10 times as long in prison as you would have done before because suddenly MDMA was seen as neurotoxic and having all sorts of hor horrendous side effects. So we got, we stood up in court arguing against record eight, arguing against people like Andy Parrott who'd made much of his career out of saying how awful MDMA was. And we actually presented to this judge who was a very intelligent man and took in what we were saying with the real evidence showing that when you stop using ecstasy, your brain goes back to normal, all the stuff that Ricorte had been saying was based on animals, and if you base research on rats, we'd have never had um, aspirin, because aspirin kills rats, but it doesn't kill human beings, and it's a very useful drug. In the end, the sentencing for ecstasy was reduced by 60%, 60 mm -hmm. yeah. So that was a real kind of nice experience of science managing to get things changed in the real world. And drug science is taking credit for that. It wasn't just Val. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> David takes credit for it. <laughs> okay, we're going to throw it open. We've got 10 minutes for questions. So we, if you've got the question, put your hands up and Max will get the microphone to you. And maybe say who you are so we can uh, get to know you a bit better. Hi, uh, my name's Ollie, and I had a question regarding how you described the ratcheting of drug laws has been going up over the years. Is this proportional to perhaps the increase of drug users or gang crimes? Or do you believe that it's coming from political bickering or media influences? I don't think it's proportional to anything, but it's not completely arbitrary either. There are drivers of it. And this, mor this moral positioning is one of them. I mean, my, as I, I mentioned, Jock Young, that these, he was one of the people who came up with the concept of the moral panic. And we've seen quite other moral panics around various substances over the years. I think 
you know, we're having a bit of a mini moral panic at the moment about nitrous oxide and people, you know, our concerns about young people and the terrible time they've been having through the pandemic and the way they've been spending their free time has sort of transmogrified themselves into, oh shit, we hate all these canisters being left around and aren't these kids doing themselves terrible harm? So it's, it's you know, those sorts of concerns morph into a simplistic call. Again, I'll, I'll use a phrase of Jock Young's. He calls it the cosmetic fallacy. The idea that complex social problems have simple solutions and a simple solution that politicians often reach for is if there's a problem with a substance, be it GHB, be it nitrous oxide, be it cannabis, the simple solution to reach for is let's ban it, and if it's already banned, let's raise it up, the Misuse of Drugs Act. So I think there are a lot of complex you know, social processes that then get boiled down to these rather simplistic calls for control. Yeah, the most horrible uh, example of the ratchet system was, is actually is around cannabis, because when... When cannabis was downgraded from A and B to C, the penalty for dealing or, or importation was increased from seven years to 14 years to sort of offset the, the perceived liberalization of cannabis. Now, cannabis has been moved from, from C back to B, but they've still kept the 14 years for the, the you know, supply or, 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 um, or importation. So, you know, that's a, just a, prof, you know, that's a doubling of penalties. You know, that's, you know, horrible, you know, extreme ratcheting. Right, other questions? Down the front here, Ryan. And then over there. Hi, everyone. I had a question about the, the policy in London to decriminalise cannabis possession in certain boroughs and how that's going and what do you think the next steps are for that programme? I'm going to enter professor mode and say it's not decriminalisation. You're talking about diversion. So the proposal is not to change the law so that it's no longer an offence to possess these substances. The proposal, as I understand it, from Sadiq Khan has been to, if people are coming into contact while they're in possession with, of drugs, they'll be diverted away from a charge and there are various sort of out-of-court disposals that be, can, can be used to do that. I think there's an interesting dispute going on within the Labour Party and people like Wes Streeting trying to prove how tough they are by saying that Sadiq Khan's out of line, that we're going to slap, slap him down and he can't do this. I think Sadiq Khan is actually in line with the majority of opinion in the London population. So that's going to be an interesting viewpoint. And it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of the new commission. There are some people on the room who are on the, that commission that Sadiq Khan has set up to try and advise a more sensible drug policy for London. I'll be interested to see what happens. Hi there. Uh, my name is Tom. Well, as you mentioned at the start, the horrible impact of the opiate crisis in the US, obviously in a market where opiates are legalised. What's the best way to sort of alleviate concerns that sort of a similar thing could happen with the legalization of drugs, of like all other drugs in other markets? Is it the case that all of the drugs should only be distributed by the government? And if that's the case, could you have legalization where, where it would come from anyone other than where the source would be anyone other than the government? You don't have yeah. to answer that in depth because roles will in the next talk, but <laughs> give, them, give them a little pointer there. I'm also going to give a personal view. There's a difference between uh, regulation and legalisation as well. For me, I think personally, uh, there's a great role there for regulation about how you're able to access those substances and taking them out of their hands of criminal gangs, essentially. And also providing some assurance about what someone's actually getting and when they purchase them. I think the situation in North America is very different in terms of how it's gone ab uh, come about. The heroin market is pretty much non-existent. It all kind of feeds off fentanyl. So you're dealing with substances that are significantly more potent as well. When you said about the substances being legally obtainable, I, I wonder if you mean more around kind of oxycodone and, and some of the challenges that they had and overprescribing and, and how that came about and the influence of Big Pharma. So I think that's probably perhaps something that we all need to remain vigilant for and around how Big Pharma may choose to operate particularly thinking about where it was maybe marketed as not being addictive, et cetera, and some of the kind of freebies that different healthcare professionals also managed to get out of part of that. And there's some really good, I think it's good Netflix documentaries and things if you wanted to, to see more. So I think the, the setup and situation in North America has been different to here. I think our drug, you know, we still have access to heroin. You know, in Again, it, it fluctuates, but in a better than, say, for example, the states are. 
It doesn't mean to say we don't occasionally get um, alerts that we've got fentanyls or ISO and things, you know, alerts that we've had even in the last couple of years, but it's nothing like the state that they've got over there. And even then, you know, it's, it's in all of their, you know, pretty much all of their substances. Um, and where we're seeing kind of spates occasionally happen, again, not to go into the, someone due kind of panic mode that you're describing, Alex, but it's something, you know, it has only really been in heroin that we've really seen it. So again, highlights around our take home naloxone provision and the need for drug checking and the need to be able to allow somebody to use substances in a place where they can be monitored and thinking about our overdose prevention sites and the needs for some of these other things, really. Again, from that, that harm reduction messaging. So I don't know if I'm in a roundabout way, I've sort of answered your question knowing who's going to feature on the next panel, which may, you know, may answer more of that, or maybe in the break we can have more of a chat if that's okay. Thank you. All right. Hello, I'm Joanna. I just wanted to ask, do you see naloxone being given in the future to family or friends that have opioid dependent like individuals in their lives so they can give it to them? Like how you would carry antihistamines or um, an Was that naloxone, sorry? Yeah. 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 yeah, so we're already able to do that. We can, so specialist drug treatment services can give it to friends, family members, Police, hostels, anyone, all of our outreach staff, in fact, I'd argue all of our treatment service delivery staff can already do that. And we can do that without a prescription or other kind of legal frameworks, and we can give it out for free. We've got to pay for the service, pay for it, but we can give it out for free. Hopefully, with this legislative change, fingers crossed, comes, means that it won't just have to be provided by the specialist treatment services. So it could be given out more readily, for example, by hospitals or, for example, if the police or ambulance service came across somebody that they'd be able to, you know, they're not a specialist treatment provider, but they'd be able to then give it to somebody in terms of take home um, doses as well. The challenge, though, is still being able to afford it. So... Our treatment services have been massively underfunded. It's been fantastic that since that you mentioned Dave Carroll back earlier, and with the review that's come out, that there is now more money available. But that's not come out overnight. And some of that's going to be phased and graduated. And if we don't make the most of it, it ain't going to come again in the future. The other challenge with that is if you were to look at the narrative and go, well, that's great. Treatment services certainly from this year have got a bit more funding. It hasn't all come to the treatment service, despite that narrative. Actually, some treatment services have had to actually submit tenders to get hold of that money. Some, it hasn't given, been given to the treatment services at all. So there is still a narrative there about, well, even if the legislation changes, how are we going to afford this? What, you know, where's that going to come from? You know, a packet of the injectable is the best part of, it's about 18 quid, best part of 20 quid a pack. The intranasal is significantly more. So, and again, intranasal's got lots of advantages in terms of it doesn't have a sharps device in it. If somebody is in recovery, doesn't want to be associated with needles anymore, but may still see their you know, friends, for example, that may be still actively using, that they are, they don't have to carry that sharps device. If we're giving out to young people, if we're giving out to friends and family who don't want to have to come with it, you know, have to use a needle, there can be massive advantages, but it's still going to be paid for somehow. Thank you. We'll take one last question then. Thanks. Uh, my name is Andrew. I wanted to ask, with the potential uh, legalization in the US on a federal level of cannabis, do you think that that will eventually lead to the UK government relaxing their attitude and following the US federal government in decriminalizing or legalizing in the UK? How much of an influence will the US federal decriminalization? decriminalization? It depends what we can offer them in return, I guess. I mean, I've often said all our drug laws, the Misuse of Drugs Act 71 was made at the behest of Americans. I don't know if anyone knows, we didn't put in the book exactly what, uh, what the deal was for us to do what they told us, but maybe we could come up with some. Where do we want the next uh, nuclear um, arsenal stored? No. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, okay. it's Reed Toby said in his paper, uh, last chapter of the book, and he, he, he doesn't make the argument that it's an American idea. The, okay. the Misuse of Drugs Act was fairly well homegrown. As to whether we're going to follow the Americans, I think the main benefit of the progress that's been made in America on drug policy reform is to take the pressure off. I don't think there's much desire in either our two main political parties to follow the Americans down that track. But at least if they did, the USA has got no legitimacy now to try and prevent any other country from liberalising its laws, given that within its own borders and even at federal level, it is liberalising and going against the international conventions 
itself. I don't have a lot of hope that this is some beacon the British government will follow because of the moral positions that people who are in the most influential positions take. Well, we might disagree on the origins of the 71 Act, but I can guarantee that the criminalization of CAT was driven directly by the US. But anyway, that's another story. Let's uh, thank the three uh, people on the panel. I'm going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to have the second session. So thanks, everyone.